Okay, welcome everybody to the Good Hormone Health webinar, April 3rd, 2022. Tonight's webinar is entitled Dr. Friedman's View on the Pituitary Society, quote, consensus, unquote, guidelines on Cushing's disease and new Cushing's medicines. Thanks everybody for joining us tonight. And we will have time for uh, questions in the chat. I did mute everybody. Um, so wait for the chat and then uh, you can ask questions. Wait till the end, you can ask questions in the chat. So we're gonna talk a little bit about the paradigm for Cushing's testing, the use of imaging for diagnosis of Cushing's disease, the need for multiple tests to diagnose episodic Cushing's disease, the importance of urinary cortisol and salivary cortisol testing, the use of medication trial prior to surgery, the use of ketoconazole for the medication trial and longer term treatment. And I'll also spend a good portion of time discussing some new Cushing's medications. So the consensus on diagnosis and management of Cushing's disease a guideline update was published in Lancet Diabetes and Endocrinology in November two, October online 2020, came in, pre, in hard copy on November 2021. Um, and uh, the first author is Maria Flesheru from Oregon Health Sciences, and there's 50 people on this, of which Dr. Friedman is not. Um, I'm not going to really get into why I was not included. I'm, I don't really participate much in the Pituitary Society, which sponsored this. And I think um, I'm probably um, maybe a little bit ahead of the field. And we're going to talk a little bit about that. Um, but anyways, I was not included, but I think it's important guidelines. Um, and you'll see how some of the things that I proposed over these last uh, decade, decade or so related to Cushing's have gotten incorporated into these guidelines. The one before this was published, I think, in 2016 or so. And you know, some of the things they talk about, Cushing is pretty obvious. Cushing disease requires uh, accurate diagnosis, careful treatment selection, and long-term management to optimize patient outcomes. So this is the, basically the, uh, the paradigm that they recommend. Um, first of all, you start with, does the patient take exogenous glucocorticoids, oral injectors, inhalers, or topical, stop it and fall symptoms, access the likelihood of endogenous Cushing syndrome. If it's low, you do a screening test. If it's intermediate or high, you can do two or three screening tests. The screening tests include the late night salivary cortisol test. You can do two or more of them, 24 hour urine free cortisols, two or more of them. So this again is quite uh, new compared to prior guidelines where they just did one test. And I think this recognizes a point that I've made uh, over these years that most patients are what's called episodic. They have high cortisols mixed in with normal cortisols. So you do have to do multiple testing. I'm glad the, the Pituitary Society and this consensus recognize that. The third test um, I don't recommend uh, for the period episodic patients called the overnight one milligram dexamethasone suppression test. So you can do these tests and if they're uh, normal, Cushing syndrome is, is unlikely or cyclical. They incorrectly use the word cyclical. Cyclical means a, a given pattern, um, like a sine wave. So I think the correct word is episodic, but they say if it's, uh, the, but they are recognizing Cushing syndrome as cyclical Cushing syndrome exists. And um, so that's important. Um, and if they're abnormal, you repeat the screening test. So again, they're pushing salivary cortisols, UFCs and DEX testing. Um, you can exclude non-neoplastic hypercortisolism or pseudo Cushing's. And they say it's considered DEX CRH test, desmopressin test or midnight serum cortisol. Um, in the past, they've been a higher emphasis on these other tests. I think they're really recognizing that the UFCs and the salivaries are really the best test for this. Um, so you go down the pathway here, and if these tests, again, are normal, it's either cyclical Cushing's or Cushing's unlikely. If they're abnormal, Cushing's is diagnosed uh, periodically. If they're discrepant, you can reevaluate them. They talk about the type of pseudo Cushing's psychiatric disorders, alcohol use disorder, pregnancy, severe obesity, polycystic ovarian syndrome, uncontrolled diabetes, anorexia, malnutrition, which is, you know, very, anorexia is usually not masquerading as Cushing's, uh, excessive exercise, illness or surgery, high cortisol body globulin state, that shouldn't affect things like uh, urinary free cortisol um, or salivary cortisol and glucocorticoid resistance, which usually has a different clinical scenario and it's quite rare. Um, and then they measure the ACTH. Dr. Friedman measures the ACTH initially. A low ACTH is ACTH independent Cushing's. You go down the path to the adrenal CT or MRI. If it's no in, uh, no end uh, adenoma or equivocal, um, you're over here. Um, and then for some reason they have you go to, um, um, I guess uh, it could be a topic here. I'm not sure what happens if your adrenal CT is positive. I guess they send you to surgery here. 
Um, and then you go down this wide is if the ACTH is normal or high, get a pituitary MRI. If the adenoma is present, and I'll talk about this, I disagree with this part here. If it's six to nine millimeters, you can, it's, um, it's, you have to do a petrosal sinus sampling. If it's greater than 10 millimeters, you can do, you can assume that it's pituitary uh, disease. Um, you can do a CRH or desmopressin test plus a whole body CT scan. I'm not sure I understand why. Or you can do patrol sinus sampling if there's a pituitary gradient uh, present, Christian disease, and the pituitary gradient is absent, ectopic Christian disease. We'll talk about patrol sinus sampling also. Um, so the overall conclusion of this uh, workup was that it's still the algorithm. It still emphasizes urinary free cortisol, late night salivary cortisol testing, which they abbreviate as LNSC and dexamethasone suppression testing. Um, there's emphasis on multiple testing, especially for the salivary cortisols. There's a decreased emphasis than in the past on the DEX CRH test and the desmopressin test. Um, in terms of the DEX test, uh, our paper, and I'll show the data in the, in the next slide, um, low sensitivity and specificity in uh, patients with mild Christian disease. So I don't recommend um, the, the, CRA, the uh, dexamethasone suppression test. They comment that urinary free cortisol is random variation as high as 50%. Well, first of all, so is the salivary cortisols in the DEX test. And this is due to the episodic nature of cortisol secretion. It's not just due to random variation. So this is my article on the uh, overnight dexamethasone suppression test. Uh, we published that about 10 years ago. If you use the cutoff of five, you had three patients above it. If you use the cutoff of 1.8, which people are using, you had several patients right around this 1.8, but the assay isn't that good at less than two anyways. So I'm not sure you're making that much of a case if somebody, well, this person is two and this person's 1.7 and this person's 1.6. So I didn't find this, uh, the, the DEX test uh, particularly helpful and I continue to not find it that helpful. You also can have a lot of people with Cushing's disease that do suppress the DEX, either if they're not high or they're not, their tumor, only 50% of the tumors have these um, DEX medicine feedback on them. Um, so this is what they use for, um, um, for diagnosis and monitoring of Christian's disease. It's a little like that first one, but a little more um, um, uh, concrete here. Um, you could start with urinary free cortisol, late night salivary cortisols, or both. Dexamethasone suppression tests may be an option if late night salivary cortisols are not feasible. In a lot of places in Europe, they don't do salivary cortisol testing, and they come in multiple late night salivary, salivary cortisol testing might be easier for patient collection. I agree with that. So if, you, if you're confirming Christian disease, you can do any test. Um, so it's not really that clear what the difference between the confirming and the suspicion is. The interfreeze cortisol averages, uh, at, you can average two to three collections. Um, not sure why you would do that if you have two highs and one low. I don't know why you would average it. Late night salary cortisol test is uh, two or more. DEX is uh, useful in shift workers, um, but not in women on estrogen containing contraceptives. You can measure the DEX concentration with cortisol concentration. The morning after one milligram dex, dexamethasone ingestion improves test interpretability. If you suspect an adrenal tumor, start with uh, an overnight uh, DEX test and late night salivary cortisol is lower specificity. To monitor for recurrence, you consider which test was abnormal at the initial diagnosis. I agree with that. Late night salvo should be sensitive, should be done annually. I'm going to probably only do it if somebody has uh, symptoms of Cushing's recurrence. Uh, the DEX test and the university cortisol become abnormal after the late night salivary cortisol and recurrence. It depends on, I think, what test is in high initially. Urinary free cortisol is the last test to become abnormal. But again, it depends on you know, if you're testing when you're in a high and what test was abnormal at the beginning. So they conclude there is no um, single preferred diagnostic test for Cushing syndrome, nor is there consensus on how to decide whether and when to test, despite attempt to, to develop a score for ease of diagnosis. Um, so this consensus panel didn't seem to get too much of a consensus on this. Clinical judgment and index of suspicion for Cushing syndrome are important. I agree with that. And underscore the need for individual decisions about timing and selection for diagnostic testing on the basis of the clinical scenario. In other words, I think you need multiple testing when the patient is in a high. They didn't really talk about uh, testing when people are in a high yet, but I think they will in the future. Um, another area they didn't discuss, which I think is crucial, and that uh, I'm making, um, I'm realizing that this is really important, is the medicines that are affecting cortisol. Uh, most patients with Cushing's have trouble sleeping. Many of them have anxiety and depression. So the majority of the patients 
will go on some kind of sleep medicine. The sleep medicines and some of the anxiety and depression medicines, which I'll show in the next uh, table, affect cortisol. So the question is, you know, do you still keep these patients on these medicines? This wasn't discussed at all in the consensus problem but at panel, but I think this is crucial. It's unclear the, uh, the size of the effect, but it's likely to be significant. I've had patients that had normal cortisols when they're taking sleeping medicines, they stopped it and their cortisol levels jumped up, you know, two or three fold. Um, it's unclear how often, how long the patient needs to be off these medicines to give a true reading. I usually have people stop it the day before, but you know, you may need a longer time. Some of the medicines are quite hard to stop. Um, others can be stopped pretty easily. And this is uh, my table. Um, I published this in uh, the Cecil's Essentials chapter on adrenals I wrote. Um, so some of the key ones, you know, obviously medicines that lower cortisol can lower it uh, in the top here. Uh, some of the psych medicines, for example, Celexa and Zoloft, they increase cortisol here. Uh, fluoxetine, Prozac is neutral. Desipramine, Trazodone lowers it. Mercazepin lowers it. Um, Zyprexa, Seroquel, several patients are on those, they lower it. Um, Ativan, Z Xanax, and Restorol lower it quite a, a fair amount. And I think the uh, lorazepam is um, a fair amount in the, uh, I find a fair amount of lower cortisol lowering in the literature and said no effect. Uh, Cabergoline, bromocryptine may lower it. Um, Reglan uh, raises it. Ritalin may raise it a little bit, but only found in one study. I'm not sure that's really a clinically significant interaction. Clonidine lowers cortisol. Um, some of the uh, opiates, uh, lobipramide, morphine, uh, codeine, most of the um, more opiates, lower cortisol, uh, buprenorphine lowers it, naloxone um, can raise it. And then you have naltrexone, which raises it, but a lot of people are on this low-dose naltrexone. I'm not sure if that has the same effect as the regular naltrexone, which is a little bit higher dose. Drugs of abuse, cocaine, heroin lowers it, cocaine raises it, alcohol raises it and tobacco and nicotine raises cortisol. In terms of hormones, progesterone can lower cortisol. Megase is a medicine that's used for weight gain. It's a progesterone progestin. It has a pretty dramatic effect on, on lowering cortisol. People can get adrenaline sufficient from uh, megase. Growth hormone lowers it, but really it's really inside the cell. It doesn't really affect testing that much. Um, so I, don't, I usually don't have people stop their growth hormone. Thyroid increases the catabolism. Again, it's mostly inside the cell. It doesn't affect testing, so I don't have people stop of it. A reloxifene uh, decreases it. Birth control pills raise cortisol binding globulin um, and raises total cortisol, but doesn't affect free cortisol and doesn't affect um, your testing. DHEA um, is, uh, lowers it, cortisol. Um, DDAVP um, raises it, um, only a fairly minor amount. Oxytocin lowers it, um, fairly anecdotal reports of that. Uh, rosy glitazone, an uh, old diabetes medicine that really isn't used anymore. Initial studies found some lowering effect, uh, but not confirmed by other studies. Pioglitazone or Actos definitely has a lowering effect. Uh, phospholipidylserine has, um, or Seros is a supplement over the counter that lower cortisol. Ginkgo biloba lowers it. Uh, Rodea, Rhodiola lowers it. And St. John's wort raises cortisol. So I think these are uh, very important medical interactions that are important for the testing um, were missed by the Endocrine Society, the Pituitary Society consensus statement. Um, they talk about pituitary imaging and prior consensus panels, pituitary imaging was mentioned, but not stressed. And there's still feel that it shouldn't be done until the diagnosis is made, but they're not that strong about that. I think there's much more emphasis and most people do an MRI earlier than they did in the past as I do. Um, they say the MRI is the imaging method of choice for detecting a secreting pituitary tumor. And then this is a statement that I think is just flat out wrong, it's old data. However, in part, because most lesions are very small due to the use of a standard 1.5 Tesla MRI, only approximately 50% of microdenomes are clearly depicted, depicted. This is from data when I was at the NIH in 1995 or 1993, we published a paper that showed 50% of microadenomes are, are detected. But now, um, you know, with a three Tesla MRI, experienced neurosurgeon reviewing, it, almost all the patients with Cushing disease have a lesion on their MRI. Um, and I showed that, I think it's in the next slide also. Um, but uh, I think they used old data on this. Um, they also made a comment that tumor size does not necessarily correlate with degree of hypercortisone. That is true. In fact, patients with larger adenomas can prevent with mild hypercortisone. So I don't know why they make a big deal about the size. 
on whether you need to do patrols of sinus sampling or not, because I think it's definitely true that the smaller tumors, such as the you know one to two millimeter ones, are the ones that are usually the main problem in Cushing's disease. The ones that are bigger are either non secreting or usually make a low amount of cortisol. So this brings us to the question. There was a consensus that all patients with lesions less than six millimeters should have an IPSS. They just said that the size doesn't matter. So why are they making these people have an IPSS if it's less than six millimeters? And those with lesions of 10 millimeters or larger don't need the IPSS. I would disagree with that. I would say the larger tumors are probably non-secreting tumors and the smaller ones are the ones that don't need the IPSS. Um, and I think the ACTH level is crucial. If you have an ACTH level sort of between 10 and 80, or, 15 and 80 or so, I think you're pretty likely to have pituitary Cushing's. If you're really a high ACTH level, you could then have a topic and then it might be worthwhile doing patrol to sinus sampling. And uh, so in my hands, um, you, before you do the patrol to sinus sampling, the odds of having pituitary Cushing's are 90%. So you have to have a test that's better than 90% for it to be worthwhile. And, um, you, um, and the patrol to sampling, sampling doesn't do that. It's just as good as, um, as chance basically. It's an invasive test, so I'm not sure why anybody would uh, want to um, would would advocate that when it's almost sure to be pituitary anyways. Why would you put somebody through invasive test? It doesn't really increase the odds, especially if you already admit that um, the tumors, the size of the tumor, isn't really that important. So here's my data: the pituitary MRI. Uh, we had, I think it was about eight, 20 patients or so, consecutive patients, and they all have pituitary tumors except for except for I think two or three of them. Probably if we looked at their MRI carefully, we would have seen a lesion on them. Uh, but uh, two, two, two of them, one of them did not have anything. Two of them had asymmetry and 23 of them had uh, uh, a pituitary lesion. So the MRI is quite helpful and uh, picks up lesions uh, in patients with pituitary Cushing's. So I found that 90% of the patients with Cushing's disease had a visible tumor in MRI and 95% had an abnormal MRI. We published this in 2007. Um, and I think some of the key things that uh, were not discussed in the consensus guidelines um, is that a 3T MRI that is properly read is unlikely to miss a tumor. So if you have a negative MRI, um, you probably don't have Cushing's or at least it might be too small and it might be too early. Um, another problem I'm seeing is, you know, when I look at the MRIs myself, about half of them are poorly done. The dye's too much, they don't do dynamics. Uh, the dynamic is crucial. Um, the, um, the consensus guidelines talk about a, a spin uh, MRI. I don't think that's as good as the dynamics. And I think that's only done in a few centers. In general, the dynamics are widely done. Um, but if the MRI is not done, the radiologist doesn't want to admit it because then it shows that their center is not doing a good job. And then they say it's, everything's okay. I think also some radiologists, not all of them, but some of them may look really fast at the images and may miss small lesions. Um, the dynamic sequences are usually the most helpful. I'm pretty convinced the three TM MRIs are better than 1.5. I haven't seen much advantage of the 70s. I think they're probably worse so far, it's my, my experience. Um, I think they're just not done as carefully. Um, they, they try to make up for the higher magnet. Um, so I don't think that's, um, I don't think the 70s right now at least are needed over the 3T. Um, and I came up with a checklist that tells what, uh, what to do. You want fine cuts through the pituitary, you want to use a 3T, you want dynamics. I always see the, the sequence, the lesions on dynamic sequences. They're the most helpful. So this is the management for Cushing syndrome. Um, it's um, also pretty common sense, but they interesting, they start at the top, preoperative medical therapy in select cases. This is new. So they didn't really do that much before. Their select cases include um, patients with their, you know, inoperable, not, not healthy enough, high, very high cortisol levels. Um, I think, and I'll talk about this when we talk about the medicines, that this is going to expand. And I think it's going to change that a medical treatment is going to be the first line in many cases. Um, but they touch it on it briefly, they, and um, they don't really commit themselves that this should be part of the, um, the standard workup. So pituitary surgery is still re recommended. If it's not feasible, you go down to medical therapy or radiation therapy. I would do medical therapy over radiation therapy, of course. If it's a larger invasive tumor, you can do radiation therapy. Um, if, you have, um, if you have a surgery, uh, you have to monitor for recurrence. If uh, you, have, you may have to reoperate. Um, medical therapy could be used um, in patients who, fa who failed surgery, um, not a surgical candidate. 
Uh, they don't really define exactly when they use the medical therapy, um, but I think medical therapy is crucial and so become um, uh, more important. Uh, if you do medical therapy, you can get control, partial control or no control. Um, I think if you use the right drugs, you get good, pretty good control. You could do another drug or consider combination therapy. Uh, you could have control, you monitor for cortical control, uh, tumor progression, you can do serial MRIs. Um, if there's no control, you can give uh, bilateral adrenalectomy and then uh, radiation therapy also can lead to bilateral adrenalectomy. So this is fairly uh, common sense um, algorithm. Uh, so then I want to talk a little bit about this concept about perioperative medical therapy in select cases that they, have, okay, that they mentioned. I've been advocating this for years. It can be used to determine how much a patient's symptoms are due to high cortisol. I think this is crucial. You have people that I'm not that convinced their symptoms are due to high cortisol and others I am. So you put people on a trial just like you would do that for several other diseases um, um, you want to see people and how they respond before you commit them to surgery. It gets the people healthier, their, their wounds heal better if they're not hypercortisolemic. Um, and I give ketoconazole, I used to stop it two weeks before, but now I give it up to the day before surgery. Um, and this, I think, decreases the drop from high cortisol to normal cortisol post-op. A lot of patients that they go to, um, um, that are dropping, you know, post-op, they feel really lousy. I think if you normalize the cortisol pre-op, the drop is going to be less. Not everybody it has that less, less of a drop, but it, it should help people. Um, the consensus panel makes it says it might be harder to see a drop in cortisol post-ops and determine the cure. But I think it's hard to tell that in episodic patients anyways, because their cortisol post-op is often usually not that low and they're still cured. So I definitely think this uh, preoperative treatment is crucial. So what are the medical treatments for Christian disease? Um, we'll go over this in the next um, part of the talk here. Uh, ketoconazole is, in my opinion, still the best medicine. Uh, the second best is, I, is um, called a, new, a fairly new one called Isteresa. The generic name is Acilodrostat. Um, it works well. It has a lot of side effects. I'll explain why. It's really the same compound as Materoprone. Materoprone has been around for uh, decades. It's very hard to get now. And this Isteresa is somewhat replaced. It blocks the same enzyme, does the same thing, um, and basically has the same effect as, as Materoprone. It's quite effective but with a, a problem with it, and I'll show that in a second. Uh, recently, Rikorlev, which is levo ketoconazole, got released. I'll explain what that means. Um, it's, a, it's sort of a, a new drug. It is FDA approved. Um, I don't see much advantage of over ketoconazole. I'll explain why about that in a second. Uh, Corlem, it used to be called RU486 or methapristone. You can get adrenal insufficiency easy on it. It's hard to monitor and it's hard to correct the adrenal insufficiency. Uh, Carbergaline is sporadic. Um, it works in a few pa some patients. Uh, Pizzeriotide is a somatostatin analog. It works poorly and gives diabetes. The other ones are rarely used. Uh, Aminoglutethamide, I'm not sure if it's available. Mitotane is available. It, I have one patient on it. Um, it has permanent adrenal insufficiency. In theory, it's hard to swallow. It gives you a lot of nauseousness. It's a very big pill. It's not really that suitable compared to some of these other ones. Uh, Trilostate is a medicine that can be given IV. Um, I don't really use that one either. So it's very important to understand the, the cortisol synthesis. So I have my, uh, my figure for my Cecil's Essentials chapter here, and you can see cortisol right in the middle over here. Oops. Uh, cortisol in the middle. Both hysteresis, which is in the... Um, greenish uh, hash mark sign, uh, number sign, and ketoconazole, which is in the red, blocks this step here, the 11, the 21 hydroxylase uh, step. Ooh, I think I did it wrong, actually. It blocks this step here, number four. Sorry about that. I got to move that over. It blocks the 21 hydroxylase step. doesn't block the 11 hydroxylase step. blocks this one here, and therefore you can get precursors build up. You get the uh, 11 deoxycortisol or DOC buildup, you get progesterone. And by blocking this enzyme, your ACTH goes up and then you make more testosterone and you go down more DHEA and you go down this pathway. So by having the hysteresa, when you block this just one step here, you get buildups, you get hypertension from having this 11 DOC buildup and you get um, 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 uh, androgen excess by having your testosterone go up because of the um, ACTH going up. However, when you use ketoconazole, it blocks several steps. It blocks here, 
It blocks here, it blocks here, and it blocks testosterone. Because of this blocking, it blocks also the aldosterone a little bit. So because of the ketoconazole blocks several steps, um, it doesn't lead to the precursor buildup. You don't get the high hypertension, which is very common in Cushing's. You don't get the androgen excess. You don't get the mineral corticoid excess uh, of the, uh, the dope bead buildup. And the ketoconazole, because it blocks many steps, I think has much less side effects. Um, you can use the ketoconazole in combination with Istromisa to try to lower these precur precursors. I've had several patients on the Istromisa that have these buildups, they get hypertension, they get androgen excess, um, and it's, um, it's quite a, a dangerous drug in terms of that. So ketoconazole is off-label use. It's not FDA approved for Cushing syndrome in the United States, but is approved in Europe. Uh, it works by blocking several steps in cortisol biosynthesis and may also inhibit pituitary cell growth. So it may have some roles in decreasing the pituitary tumor, may or may not. It has a short half-life by six to eight hours. It's uh, most, it half, half of it's gone. Most of it, a good portion of it's gone. So you can give it at, at nighttime. Cushing's disease is a disease of high cortisol at night. So I like to give the ketoconazole at night. I'm not sure why the consensus panel hasn't caught on to that idea yet, although I'll show my last slide that they're thinking about that. Um, the side effects include elevation of liver test, which is reversible on stopping the drug. The liver test abnormalities are more pronounced at higher doses, greater than 1,200. For my case, I usually start at 400, can go up to 600. I rarely go above 1,000 milligrams, so I don't really see much of those liver tests. I also give vitamin E 400 units a day to help protect the liver, which seems to work fairly well also. You should check liver function tests at baseline every two to three months. And then this new idea about increasing the QT interval, I'll explain that in a second. Cushing's disease is disease of high cortisol at night, so you give some people have low daytime cortisol, so I give ketoconazole one, uh, one hour and three hours before bedtime, 200 milligrams. You can give it three times a day, lunch, dinner, and bedtime. You can go up for severe hypocortisolism. And occasionally people get adrenaline insufficient in the morning, but they usually don't because the ketoconazole sort of worn off by the morning. Um, um, you can uh, give people five milligrams of hydrocortisone to be taken in the morning um, if symptoms of adrenal insufficiency occur, such as nauseousness, vomiting, diarrhea, abdominal pain, or achiness and they could take either a half a pill or a full pill. The ketoconazole works in almost all the patients. I think I have fairly an 80 or 90% success rate with it. You need to educate the patients about adrenal insufficiency. It interacts with some drugs, especially the statins are the main one, and some of the psych meds. Um, the statins, if you're at the highest dose of a statin, you should, you should back down on the dose of a statin. So 40 milligrams of Lipitor becomes 80 milligrams. So you shouldn't use 80 milligrams. Lipitor, you want to start with, you want to decrease the dose to 40 milligrams if a patient is on a statin. Um, rarely this long QT interval is seen. I'll show that in the slide coming up. Um, and I like to use this again to mention, see how much the patient's symptoms are due to high cortisol. Gets the patient healthy every surgery. I give it up to the day before surgery. Helps decrease the drop from high cortisol to normal cortisol post-op. I used it before adrenalectomy and may decrease the hyperplasia seen on pathology because it blocks cortisol synthesis. You can monitor symptoms. You should manage your urinary cortisol. You should not manage, uh, monitor 17 hydroxysteroids because the precursors interact with the 17 hydroxysteroid assays and they'll go up. And then you can look at serum cortisol. General serum cortisol should drop a little bit. ACT should go up. Um, and I think you can use this for years. Um, I've had several patients on it for at least five years, monitor liver function tests, monitor the pituitary MRI. If you start seeing something on the MRI, you could uh, consider then stopping it and doing more testing and surgery. Um, but I think this medicine works very uh, remarkably well. Some people call it really a life game or life changer. Uh, because this medicine works effective and is cheap, um, it should be the gold standard compared to new drugs. So that would make sense. However, the new drugs are, this is not on patent. This is a, a, a inexpensive medicine, um, generic. The new drugs are on patent, they're expensive. And the drug company doesn't want to do a test showing the ketoconazole is just as good as their several hundred, several you know, thousand dollar medicine uh, that's covered by insurance with, a, with a, you know, extensive pre-auth forms. They don't, they don't want to show that it's just as good. So I don't think there's going to be studies unless I end up doing them, comparing new drugs uh, with them. So let me explain about this QT interval here. So this is, you have an EKG, you have the Q wave is this little one over here, it goes up to the R, the S, and then you have a T wave here, the T wave ends here. Um, 
and you can have it sort of curved or straight here. Ketoconazole and levoketoconazole, the new medicine, rarely prolong this QT interval. They have something called a corrected QTCF, um, which should be less than 500 milliseconds between here and here. Um, and if it's not, probably people say you shouldn't use the ketoconazole or you should be concerned. I haven't seen this problem, but I haven't been doing EKGs. And so now I think I'm, I am going to recommend people to do the EKGs. The when person who does the EKG should note the QT interval or the QT corrected factor interval, QTCF on the patients. They should do it before they start ketoconazole and every year afterwards. Patients can get the EKG from their PCP or their hospital. Again, I'm not requiring this, but I think to be safe, you should, people should, patients on keto should do this. I have a lot of patients on keto. Um, so I'm gonna pull up some slides that I gave several years ago about what uh, sort of myths related to ketoconazole. Um, some endocrinologists say ketoconazole is a dangerous drug and should be used only with severe Cushing's. I find it quite safe. The main side effect is increased liver tests, which usually occur in these higher doses and are reversible. It interacts with a lot of drugs, but these interactions can be dealt with by changing the other drugs or watching for side effects. It has a short half-life, so it would be given at night when cortisol is inappropriately high in Cushing's patients. And I usually give 200 milligrams at 8 p.m. and 10 p.m. and have patients take 2.5 or 5 milligrams of Cortef in the morning if needed. Uh, people say uh, ketoconazole should be only used in those with confirmed Cushing's. Um, I use it again to determine what symptoms the patient has are due to high cortisol. And I think this is going to catch on also the, the, these guidelines published. Um, I use it in people I'm pretty sure, but not completely sure who has Cushing's. I want them to start feeling better. Um, I may have them retest again if I'm not sure they have Cushing's after the ketoconazole. And if someone doesn't get better on ketoconazole, I'm really concerned that is it really Cushing's or not. I've kept people in ketoconazole, I would say up to five or six years or so. And I stop it often for a round of testing if a patient develops a tumor or an MRI. So I wanna talk about this new medicine called levoketoconazole or Recorlev. It's just got FDA approved. It's made by a company called Xeris, X-E-R-I-S, that bought out another company called Stonebridge. And it's an enantiomer of ketoconazole. So let me explain what this means. Ketoconazole has a handedness. It could either be, um, right-handed or left-handed or a mixture of the two. The right-handed one is shown on the right side, on the left side. The left-handed one is actually shown on the, on the um, right side here. I'm not sure why they did it that way. And the, the, the levoketoconazole is what's active. The right side one on the left, which is on the left side of this picture is inactive. So when you give somebody uh, 400 milligrams ketoconazole, 200 milligrams of that is the active levoketoconazole. And 200 milligrams is the inactive um, R, uh, R ketoconazole or dextral ketoconazole, it's called. So basically, you could just give half the, uh, you know, half the, twice the dose, and you'll do the same thing as giving the levo ketoconazole. But the companies feel like this is a way to get a, pat a patent on the levo ketoconazole. So they came on the ketoconazole. So they gave them the levo ketoconazole that has um, just this left-handed uh, sidedness of it. Uh, it's more potent than its dextro or the, 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 um, the right-handed side one isomer. And it might, notice the word might, allow a lower dose of ketoconazole to achieve the same efficacy as currently utilized doses of the racemic ketoconazole. But I think it's just, you're just gonna have, um, you can just use half the dose of this new one compared to the ketoconazole and just use twice the dose. A Recorlo starting dose is 150 milligrams twice a day. It should be taken orally with or without food. The maximum recommended dose is 1200 milligrams a day or 600 milligrams twice daily. And again, I disagree with this. The ketoconazole and uh, levoketoconazole should be given at night. Um, they do list the same side effects that are somewhat similar keto, including nauseousness, vomiting, increased blood pressure, possibly from having since the steroid precursors rise. I don't think that happens too often in ketoconazole low potassium levels, fatigue, headache, abdominal pain, and unusual bleeding. Um, it uh, worked okay. It normalized uh, uh, urinary-free cortisol, mean urinary-free cortisols, and a small number of patients, 21 were studied, 52% uh, of them, uh, while the placebo only normalized in 6%. Um, it is FDA approved. It has a support group called Panther. It does require pre-off. My guess is the insurance are going to give people 
a hard time recovering this, especially when you can just give ketoconazole or give another medicine. Um, it may have less side effects than ketoconazole, but that hasn't been tested um, and it's expensive. So the insurance companies may or may not cover it. The next medicine I'm gonna talk about is called Isteresa. Isteresa is again is orlis, 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 uh, stat. It's the same as materoprone, blocks the uh, 21 hydroxylase enzyme. I'm gonna check that. I think it blocks the 11 hydroxylase enzyme. Sorry about that. Pretty sure that's the case. It's 11 hydroxylase enzyme. It is like a general general hyperplasia, same compound as materoprone. You get a buildup of cortisol precursors, which doesn't happen with ketoconazole. It leads to high testosterone, which is extra facial hair, acne, hair loss, and irregular periods. Patients with Cushing's already have those problems. It can lead to low potassium. Uh, patients with Cushing's can have that problem. It increases the cortisol precursors, such as the mineral corticoids, and uh, that give hypertension. So what I've been doing recently is adding back ketoconazole, unless people have uh, you know side effect from ketoconazole, like the liver function test. If the ketoconazole just didn't work. Most of the patients on hysteresis, I'm adding back ketoconazole to lower these uh, testosterone precursors. Most women should also go on spironolactone. Spironolactone uh, blocks the mineralcoid excess and also blocks the testosterone excess. excess. So it's spironolactone is definitely a good medicine to add with uh, hysteresis. It's available in one milligram, five milligram, or 10 milligram dose. I usually start with two milligrams at bedtime and go up to two milligrams at eight and 10 p.m. Also like the... Um, uh, the ketoconazole and the levoketoconazole, you should get an EKG at baseline every year. Um, expensive. I had to fight a lot for a couple of patients to get this. Um, it may not uh, be approved, but I still think it's a reasonable choice. Um, probably uh, works at some time pretty good. The dose can go up to, you know, like 30 milligrams. So you can really knock down people's cortisol synthesis um, and possibly um, give them some cortisol back if you need to. Um, but that you get the buildup of the precursors unless you give it with uh, ketoconazole. Okay, so then here again is the uh, step. So it really does block this step here between 11 deoxycortisol and cortisol, which is the 11 beta hydroxylase. And then you get um, a buildup of the precursors, 11 doc and 11 deoxycortisol and DOC, which have been corticoid properties here. You get um, extra testosterone by uh, shuttling down here, but the ketoconazole is much cleaner and uh, blocks multiple steps so you don't get the cortisol buildup, the precursor buildup. Another medicine that is used for Cushing's that I have um, one patient on this long-term, uh, she's doing well on it in combination with keto, so this can be used in combination with keto. It's carbergaline, the dose varies between 0.5 milligrams to seven milligrams a week. It leads to uh, biochemical remission in 30% of the patients, so low, low amount of patients get better on this. Side effects include nauseousness, headache, and dizziness. In higher doses of carbergaline, people can get valve, valve fibrosis problems. It doesn't seem to be happening in the dose used for Cushing's. Uh, this treatment represents an off-label use of the drug. Um, the next medicine is Corlum or Mephipristone or RU46. It is a glucocorticoid and progesterone receptor antagonist that can ameliorate the signs and symptoms of Cushing's syndrome. Um, the dose is uh, 300 to 1200 milligrams. This lasts a long time. So it can't be just adjusted for at, at night, like the keto or the hysteresis. Um, it usually is given once a day in the morning. And if you get um, too much of the medicine, you get adrenal insufficiency. There's no markers and um, it's hard to reverse because if you stop and it takes a long time to get out of your system, you have to give dexamethasone. Um, and you, so you can't measure it. So you have to look at things like hyperglycemia and hypertension to adjust the dose. Um, the uh, adverse events include cortisol insufficiency, fatigue, nausea, and vomiting, arthralgias, and headaches. The, the lowest dose is 300. I think it would be nicer if they would have made a smaller dose uh, because some of my patients do get this adrenal insufficiency on this medicine. You get increased mineral corticoid effects because you're um, blocking the glucocorticoid receptor, you're not blocking the mineral corticoid receptor, you get feedback and the cortisol binds the mineral corticoid receptor, and you get high blood pressure, low potassium and edema or extra fluid retention. You also, it blocks progesterone. So you will get basically, you have unimposed estrogen effect without progesterone, you get endometrial thickening and bleeding, and some people actually need a hysterectomy from this. Um, it cannot be used with ketoconazole, they both affect the P450 system. Um, it is, uh, my, I would say, my third choice. I have a few patients on it. Um, it's, it's quite good for a few patients. Um, you have to watch out for the adrenal insufficiency. There's a new medicine called Relicorlant, 
It's made by the same company. It's a specific glucocorticoid receptor, as opposed to mefepristone, which is a glucocorticoid and progesterone receptor antagonist. It's now being studied. Um, I chose not to be a study site for this. The study is very rigorous. It's like 10 visits and they don't compensate the patients or the study too much. Um, and there's multiple testing and EKGs and things like that. If somebody wants to be on this medicine, I'm not sure why, let me know and I can hook you up with it. They're doing it uh, with some colleagues of mine at Harvard UCLA. Another medicine is pizoreotide or Signafor. It's a somatostatin receptor ligand. It is FDA approved. Um, it only normalized UFC production in 15% of the patients receiving the 600 microgram dose and 26% of the patients receiving the 900 milligram dose. So compared to ketoconazole, which works in most patients, this works in very few patients. You get hyperglycemia, 73% of them had either diabetes or hyperglycemia. 92% had side effects. The sum of the side effects include also gall gallstones. I think this is a very ineffective and nasty drug and I don't recommend it. So here's my table of the different medications. Um, I'm gonna put this on my website shortly. You have ketoconazole, which is a generic, not FDA approved in the United States, but is FDA approved in Europe. Blocks uh, cortisol synthesis at several levels. You can start at 200 milligrams at eight and 10 PM, can titrate up to 1200 milligrams. The side effects are transient increase in liver function tests, increased QT interval, decreased testosterone levels. You can do levoketoconazole or, or Corlev. It's the L-isomer of ketoconazole started at 150 milligrams at 8 and 10 p.m., work your way up to 1,200 milligrams. Side effects include nauseousness, vomiting, increased blood pressure, low potassium fatigue, headache, abdominal pain, and bleeding. Hysteresa blocks the 11-hydroxylase um, enzyme. Start at 2 milligrams at bedtime, go up to 2 milligrams at 8 and 10 p.m., you can go up to 30 milligrams. Side effects include high testosterone, which would be excess facial hair, acne, hair loss in irregular periods, low potassium and hypertension. Carbergaline doses, uh, DTU receptor agonist. Doses vary between 0.5 milligrams to 7 milligrams per week. Side effects include nauseous, headache, and dizziness. Mefepristone or Corlum, a glucocorticoid receptor antagonist. Doses of 300 to 1,000 milligrams per day. Um, side effects include cortisol insufficiency, increased mineral corticoid effects such as hypertension, hypokalemia, and edemia, and anti-progesterone effects include bleeding and endometrial thickening. Pesreotide is a somatostatin receptor agonist. The doses are 600 and 900 milligrams. You get diabetes, hyperglycemia, and gallbladder issues. So we'll close by what does the future hold? Um, I think I laid out what the uh, consensus uh, says and what um, some of the things that they're following what I do and vice versa. Um, I think most patients will in the near future be treated initially with medical therapy. Um, there'll be single or combination therapy that will be used by different, various Cushing's experts. Um, I think this will be shifted to sort of a medical management. You want somebody with expertise in the medicines. Um, you want to see, use the medicine to see how much the symptoms are due to hypercortisolism, get the patient ready for surgery, prevent the post-op cortisol dip. Um, you know, in my case, uh, with superb surgeons, I think pituitary cures sort of about 70%. I think in poor surgeons, it's lower than that. Um, so I think um, medicans, medications may have a lot of advantage for several patients. Um, the medications will be used long-term. Um, those that are having side effects or breakthrough will be offered surgery. Some patients may want to stay on the surgery uh, medication long-term versus others will want to do the surgery. I think more patients with borderline workups will be treated and the number of medications will expand uh, rapidly. Now, uh, also what does the future hold? So here they have future topics of highest importance. Screening and diagnosis of Christians, they include MRI and PET imaging to improve and improve data acquisition to, uh, pr and processing to improve microdata and omic detection. Um, I think having a good radio, a good neurosurgeon look at it is key comparing different algorithms for differential diagnosis versus non-invasive strategies. I think people are going away from the total sinus sampling. Identify corticotropic adenoma mutations that all comprehensive panel genomic and proteomic tests for corticotropic adenomas. I'm not sure this is gonna be terribly helpful. Uh, complications including anticoagulation prophylactic therapy. I haven't had, I've had one patient that had a post-op blood clot out of my thousands of patients or so. Uh, this is a key point here. Treatment of Cushing's disease determine clinical benefit of restoring the circadian rhythm, potentially with higher nighttime medication dose. So this is what I've been advocating for years. I think most of these Cushing's medicines, such as ketoconazole, should be given at night. Um, I'm not sure why they enter the Pituitary Society and other 
uh, pituitary Christians experts have taken a long time to catch on to that, including some of the marketing of the new medicines they all recommended during the day. Uh, identify better markers of disease activity control, develop new, better tolerated, uh, more effective medical therapies. That sounds good. Define populations that might benefit from preoperative medical treatment. Again, that's what I'm doing right now. So thank you everybody for joining. Um, the talk will be posted on goodhormonehealth.com in the next few days. If you want to schedule an appointment, go to my website. Uh, we are booking out pretty far, but I'm happy to see all the new patients. And you can email us at uh, mail at goodhormonehealth.com. And um, let's open up the chat. So again, as uh, we talked before in the chat, um, try to make uh, overall questions, not just ask me how I diagnose you um, or a personal question, try to make them overall questions. So people can go ahead with the chat. T mentioned, you mentioned that DHEA can reduce cortisol so it's high. Wouldn't that affect someone getting a high urinary cortisol or late night salivary cortisol? Um, so the DHEA, mostly it's, uh, I find, it doesn't affect it that much. And most of the time it affects it uh, if you give the DHEA at night. I think a morning dose of DHEA doesn't affect that much. Um, but, you know, it is a, a potential problem. If, um, I think we're really getting into this uh, area about what medicines can affect testing. Um, and DHEA may be one that might be reasonable to stop for a couple of days before testing. Angela asks, can penicillin affect cortisol? I don't think so, no. What if it's not a bad DHA that is taken, but a DHA from PCOS? Um, okay, so it, it, it actually the other way around. PCOS is a condition of high cortisol. Um, it's, it's mild, but there is excess cortisol in PCOS, um, especially the 17 hydroxy steroids are elevated in PCOS. Um, there was, I tried to do a paper comparing PCOS with Christian's disease and um, in terms of the testosterone levels were lower in Cushing's and the PCOS, but their studies suggest that PCOS patients have higher cortisol level. So I do like to try to lower patients' DEGAS and testosterone with Cushing's medicines. And um, I think I think that's um, um, you know helpful. And I try to treat the DHEA and the PCOS and testosterone PCOS while I'm working somebody up for Cushing's. But the DHEA from the PCOS shouldn't affect their testing. Uh, Sherry asks, is ozempic a medication that possibly affect cortisol testing? I, as far as I know, no. I think Christian's patients do pretty well on, on ozempic and I use it a lot on their patients, but I don't think it affects testing, at least right now. I haven't seen that. Does Benadryl affect cortisol testing? I, ibuprofen, ibuprofen, no. Benadryl and might, you know, I think most of these medicines that are sleep aids um, may affect uh, lower cortisol. It's probably better to take Benadryl than to take um, uh, Ativan to sleep or a Tamoxa or um, um, Valium or something like that to sleep or Xanax. What liver and human indicates stopping ketoconazole? I would say about three times upper normal. So, you know, most of the time the liver tests go up to about 30. So I think if you're at 100, I would definitely stop it. If you're probably about 60, I'd probably cut it in half or so. Um, it depends on how much it's working um, and, uh, you know, if there's other options. Um, with ACTH Oh, well, we got one here. Is it common for people with PCOS to develop Cushing's later or the Cushing symptoms, just PCOS symptoms? So I think there's a big overlap between PCOS and Cushing's. It's hard to distinguish. Again, I'm trying to treat the PCOS while I'm working somebody up for, for Cushing's. Um, and I think people with could have both and people could be misdiagnosed with PCOS and have Cushing's and potentially the other way around also. So I think it's very helpful for PCOS. The best test I find is the bioavailable testosterone. Most endocrinologists don't put too much weight into the ovarian ultrasound. Most gynecologists look at that extensively. So I look at really the bioavailable total testosterone and DHES and try to lower that. Uh, Shara asks with ACTS levels, if suspected episodic, does it only matter if cortisol is high? ACTS levels are suspected episodic. 
So the cortisol is really the key test uh, for Cushing's, especially the nighttime one. Um, but it would really be the, um, the salivaries and the 24-hour urines that are the more important one. Um, but a high ACTH would make me more concerned. So in general, I try to look at the, the whole gestalt, you know, the symptoms, the imaging, cortisol and ACTH levels. Morning cortisol is not terribly helpful in Cushing's. But, you know, if it's sky high, it might be a little bit helpful. ACTH, if it's quite high, it would make me more lean more towards Cushing's, but I wouldn't use it for diagnostics. Um, Michelle asks, what determines episodic cyclical Cushing's? Is there a normal cycle that you just that you discovered? So cyclical means in patterns. Um, people's patterns vary. There's several articles in the literature on this. Some people have a, like a 90-day pattern. Some people have a monthly pattern. Some people have during certain parts of their cycle. What I find is most people are episodic. They just have random high cortisols. The next day, it's a normal cortisol. If you measure salivary cortisols 10 days in a row, but several of them might be normal and some of them might be low and some of them might be high, but it doesn't follow a pattern like, like a cycle. If you are episodic Cushing's and it's more mild, is medication what would be likely recommend or is there anything else that can help? Yes, yeah, so you know, I, I do tend to do people test people first. And I like to have people have some high values before starting them on a medicine. I think that's going to be um, the general consensus as we start moving forward with these medicines. I wouldn't put a normal person on, on without high cortisol levels on the medicine. So if you're episodic and you have a fair number of highs, um, then I would probably treat you with medicines before surgery. As again, I put almost everybody on medicines before surgery to see how much their symptoms uh, get better or how much the symptoms are due to Cushing's or not. Um, and then the most medicine I use is the ketoconazole. Saromi says, following up on the PCOS question to diagnose Cushing's with someone on birth control pills for PCOS, what is the best method? Um, so I don't use much birth control pills for PCOS. I think it sort of masks the problem. The birth control pills does raise the cortisol binding goblin. So if you do a DEX test, the cortisol might be high and also interferes with the DEX metabolism. Um, it doesn't really affect uh, free cortisol, such as the urinary free cortisols or the salivary cortisols. So I think if somebody needs to be on birth control pills, um, I don't use it too much for PCOS, but they need to, they can go ahead and do the Christian's test. How long do you like to keep people on ketoconazole before going to surgery? I like a three month trial. Um, and then, you know, some people want to stay on it for Lawrence. A lot of people are doing great on it and want to stay on it and decide the medicines um, uh, the way for them. Then the surgery, other people say, you know, the medicine's helping me, but I still want to go ahead and do the surgery. Is hydrodentitis superior of Do you find commonly confirmed Cushing's patients? Yes, I, I do see that a fair amount. Um, is high, and I think partially, again, the high cortisol leads to bacterial overgrowth and for wound healing. Uh, Alicia asks, is high CRP have any connection with cyclical Cushing's? Um, so CRP goes up in people that are overweight. Most Cushing's patients are overweight. Most patients have a high CRP. It's also a marker of inflammation. I think most Cushing's patients have a lot of inflammation. Um, I don't think it can be used to diagnose Cushing's as too much of an overlap with normals. So I don't usually measure it in people, but um, it, it, uh, it is uh, probably higher in Cushing's patients compared to other patients. Ivy asks, um, for a man, would it make sense to supplement tea when taking ketoconazole to deal with a lowering of tea? Um, you know, I would probably start by measuring the, the tea after uh, testosterone after ketoconazole. And only if it's low, then I would replace back. Um, Cushing's disease is, you know, at least in my hands, I think in general, it's 95% females. So I really only have a handful of men with Cushing's. Um, what, I certainly remember one of them and Mr. Farrer is also on uh, testosterone already. One of them was on testosterone. One guy I'm seeing recently um, that, you know, I'm gonna, he has low testosterone. I might put him on testosterone, on, uh, on testosterone replacement. TS, how many UFCs and late night salary cortisols do you like to see to diagnose? It depends on the patient, how high they are. Um, I want to be fairly convinced they have uh, the highs. Um, and then I'd like to see how they do on the ketoconazole and see what their imaging is.
And then, you know, if I don't feel confident enough, I would keep them on the medicine um, and then probably retest them. Francis asked, would HS flares be more common during a high or low in episodic crisis? I would say during a high. Do you take keto with food at 8 and 10 p.m.? No, I would just take it on an empty stomach. Um, Okay, everybody looks like they're a uh, Cushing's master now. Thanks everybody for joining us. It was a really nice uh, webinar. Thanks, great questions. And I'll post this in a couple of days. And uh, thank you, T. Uh, let's see, Alicia asks, I understand pituitary MRI should be done on a 3T to see any growth, but an average CT scan with contrast can be seen. Yeah, so this, the, you know, when you think about it, the lesion on the pituitary might be two millimeters or one millimeter. Usually the lesions on a CT are like one centimeter or two centimeters. So it's much easier to find uh, adrenal cushions. The radiologist doesn't need to be that superb. They just already read a lot of them. Um, there's not that many cuts through the adrenals. So the adrenals are usually fairly easily read and they don't have to be that, you know, usually they're pretty clear. It's the majority ones that are very tricky. They're very small lesions. Um, and um, that's why I usually try to look at the MRI, pituitary MRI, but not the adrenal imaging. And um, for sort of a regular adrenal CT usually works pretty well. Okay, thanks everybody. We'll see you guys later.